All right, get ready to dive into a world that I think will really fascinate you, especially as a medical microbiologist. Definitely my kind of world. We're taking a deep dive today into, well, it used to be called Bacillus megatherium. Oh, yeah, you're talking about Priesta megatherium now. That's right, Priesta megatherium. We've got some really cool insights from Mike Ricky to guide us today, along with some scientific articles that I think you'll find interesting. And get this, that bacterium is huge. Yeah, it's a real standout. I mean, we're talking 100 times larger than E. coli. Not your average microbe. That's for sure. I can only imagine what that looks like under a microscope. But here's the question that really piqued my interest. Why should a medical microbiologist care about this organism, especially considering it's generally thought of as non-pathogenic? Well, that's the puzzle we're here to solve, isn't it? And you're absolutely right to focus on its size. I mean, think about it. The name megatherium actually translates to big beast. Big beast. I like that. And it really does live up to that name. It's got the largest cell diameter among all bacillus species. Okay. Big beast definitely paints a pretty vivid picture. So we're dealing with a gram-positive rod-shaped bacterium. What else makes it stand out visually besides just its sheer size? Well, imagine those clad gram-positive rods, right? Yep. I got that picture in my head. Now picture them with these, well, these really distinctive square ends. That's what you'd see under a microscope. Measuring somewhere around 1.2 to 1.5 by 2.0 to 5.0 micrometers. Okay, so pretty big. Oh, yeah. And they often like to group together, kind of hang out in pairs or chains. So not your average ordinary micro then? Definitely not. And we can't forget about those spores. They're super important, especially when we're trying to identify it, right? Absolutely. The spores themselves, they're ellipsoidal to spherical, and you can find them in a few different locations within the cell, centrally, paracentrally, or subterminally. But here's something that's particularly interesting. The sporangia, you know, those mother cells that create the spores, well, they don't swell at all. Hmm, that's definitely a detail to keep in mind. Now, we've mentioned that Priestiopaterium is generally considered non-pathogenic, but our sources say it can act as an opportunistic pathogen sometimes. Could you break that down for us a bit? Sure. So it's not like a frontline pathogen that you'd see all the time. It's pretty widespread in the environment and mostly harmless. But it can cause problems mainly for people with compromised immune systems. So a healthy immune system can usually keep it in check. Exactly. But for those who are immunocompromised, it can be a bit of a troublemaker, leading to different types of infections. Like what kinds of infections are we talking about specifically? Things like wound infections, bacteremia, even endocarditis. Those are definitely situations that would grab our attention as medical microbiologists. For sure. And to add another layer of complexity, it seems like its widespread presence could make it a contagious contaminant in clinical specimens. You're hitting on a really crucial point there. It's everywhere, soil, dust, water, even plants. So telling the difference between contamination and a true infection, that can be a real challenge in the lab. That makes accurate lab testing even more critical. Absolutely. We can't just rely on the clinical symptoms alone. We need to isolate and identify the bacterium to know for sure if it's causing the infection. And that's where understanding its gram standing and culture characteristics becomes really important. Okay, let's get into those lab specifics then. What should we look for under the microscope after a gram stain? Well, remember, it's gram positive, but the staining can be a bit inconsistent sometimes. You might not always see that strong, classic purple. Right, right. But the morphology, that's key. Those large rods with the square ends are usually a pretty good indicator. And how about culturing this big beast? What is it like to grow on and what should we expect to see? Well, Priestia megatherium is an obligate aerobe. So it needs oxygen absolutely loves oxygen. On the netagar, it forms these large, round, convex colonies, and they have this kind of slimy look to them. Yeah, they start off non-hemolytic, but over time they change color. It's pretty fascinating to watch, actually. They turn yellow, and eventually they get even darker, becoming brown, even black. So they really stand out on the plate. They do, and some strains even produce a capsule, which adds another layer of interest. Okay, so we're looking for colonies that make a statement. Anything else about its growth we should keep in mind? One important thing to remember is that Priestia megatherium doesn't grow on BBO. Which is? Bialazidagar. That's a helpful little tidbit for differentiating it from other bacteria. Got it. So no growth on BBO helps us rule it out. Now let's move on to what makes this bacterium stand out biochemically beyond these basics. Well, it's catalase positive. Meaning? It produces the enzyme catalase. But here's a bit of a quirk. It's oxidase variable. So it's not consistent. Exactly. Some strains will be positive while others are negative. A bit of a mixed bag on that front. What other biochemical traits are worth noting? It's lecithinase negative, so it doesn't produce the enzyme lecithinase. And it's motile, thanks to its perichricus flagella. Perichricus meaning? Picture it with flagella all over its surface, like it's covered in tiny little hairs, and those allow it to move around. Quite an active little bug. Now, when it comes to treatment, what's its susceptibility to antibiotics? 
that's obviously crucial for us as medical microbiologists. Absolutely. Presea megatherium is susceptible to vancomycin. Okay, that's good to know. But it's resistant to cholestin. So those are important things to consider when we're choosing the right antibiotic for treatment. Incredibly helpful information. If anyone wants to dig a little deeper into these characteristics, our sources recommend checking out the Manual of Clinical Microbiology. It's a really comprehensive resource. But what I find particularly fascinating is the research surrounding Presea megatherium. It's not just some lab curiosity, it's making real waves in the research world. Absolutely, it's really interesting. That impressive size of it, well, that made it one of the first bacteria to have its entire genome sequenced. Wow, that's amazing. It was a real game changer for bacterial genomics. So what else has Prestumigaterium got going for it in research? Well, one of its amazing abilities is to produce a wide variety of proteins. This makes it a really valuable asset in industrial settings where it can be used to produce enzymes and other useful molecules. I see. Researchers are also looking into its potential for bioremediation. Which is? Using organisms to clean up pollutants in the environment. So not just big, but incredibly versatile. Exactly. But here's where it gets even more interesting. Prestamigaterium is a highly desirable cloning host. Meaning? Scientists can introduce foreign DNA into it, and it can then produce specific proteins. Oh, wow. The implications for biotechnology and medicine are huge. That's pretty exciting. So what makes Prestia megatherium such a good cloning host? There are a couple of key reasons. Firstly, it can hold a lot of plasmid vectors. And those are? Think of them like circular pieces of DNA that can carry foreign genes. And secondly, it's a very stable cloning host. Stable how? Well, it's got these unique external proteases. They actually protect the foreign DNA from being degraded. It's like they're acting as bodyguards. A microscopic bodyguard. I love that analogy. Right. But there's another critical element that makes Prestia megatherium such a great cloner. It lacks alkaline proteases. This may seem like a small thing, but it's actually a big deal because it prevents the degradation of those valuable recombinant proteins, the ones made from the foreign DNA. So it's like a safe space for those proteins. Exactly. And because of this, scientists have been able to develop a whole range of proteins used in both medicine and agriculture. We're talking synthetic penicillins, glucose dehydrogenase for blood tests, beta amylases that they use in making bread, and even neutral proteases for the leather industry. The list goes on and on. The applications are truly mind-blowing. It's like a tiny little factory churning out all these essential products. It really is. And there's even more. Some strains of Prestia mecateria are excellent hosts for gene expression. There's a specific strain, QMB1551, that they're currently using to produce the antigen for HIV diagnostic kits. Talk about a major contribution to public health. That's incredible. To think that this bacterium, which is so common, is at the forefront of so many advancements. Who knew? It really shows how much we still have to learn about microbes. They have such enormous potential, and we've only just begun to scratch the surface. Well, that wraps up part one of our deep dive into Prestia megatherium. We've covered so much fascinating ground, from its basic characteristics and potential for causing disease to its exciting role in research and biotechnology. It's a pretty amazing organism, that's for sure. It is. What do you say we take a short break and then come back for part two, where we'll delve deeper into the medical applications of this remarkable bacterium? Sounds good to me. I'm ready for more. Welcome back to The Deep Dive. In part one, we really dug into the world of Prestia mediterium, that bacterium that's making a real splash in research and industrial applications. I think it's safe to say this big beast is living up to its name, not just in size, but in its potential too. It really is. It's a versatile microbe, that's for sure, contributing to all sorts of advancements in medicine, biotechnology, and even when it comes to cleaning up the environment. And now, in part two, we're going to zero in on the specific applications of Prestia megatherium in medicine, the stuff that really matters to you as a medical microbiologist. This is where it gets real. We talked about its potential as a cloning host, how good it is at producing protein, and how easy it is to work with in the lab. But how does all of that translate into tackling real medical challenges? Well, think of it this way. Prestia megatherium can be a platform for producing therapeutic proteins. Antibodies, enzymes, vaccines even. Exactly. Instead of relying on those old ways of producing proteins, which can be, well, expensive and time consuming, we can use this bacterium to do the heavy lifting for us. Like having a little factory cranking out these medical tools. That's the idea. And since it's such a great protein producer, it could make those treatments way more accessible, more affordable for everyone. That would be a game changer, especially for diseases that don't have good treatments yet. 
or where the current ones are just too expensive. Absolutely. But there's more. It goes beyond just making those therapeutic proteins. Researchers are also looking at using Prestia megaterium in drug delivery systems. Drug delivery systems? You mean getting drugs to specific places in the body? Exactly. Remember how we talked about how some strains of Prestia megaterium have that capsule? Yeah. Well, we can engineer that capsule to carry drugs and target them to certain cells or tissues. Like a tiny little missile delivering the medicine right where it needs to go? Precisely. That could totally change how we approach treating diseases, making it more precise, getting rid of those side effects we don't want. Are there any other areas of research that we should be keeping an eye on? There's another really exciting avenue that researchers are investigating, the potential of Prestia megaterium for making biosensors. Biosensors, those devices that can detect specific molecules. Yeah, biomarkers. Just think about the possibilities. I am intrigued. Tell me more. These biosensors could be used for all sorts of things, from diagnosing infections to monitoring environmental pollutants. So Precia megaterium isn't just about treating diseases, but also about detecting and monitoring them. You got it. It's a microbe with so many different facets, so much potential in the medical field. And probably the most exciting part is that research is still going strong. We can expect even more groundbreaking applications to come out in the future. It's amazing to think that this bacterium, which used to be just a curiosity in the lab, could revolutionize medicine as we know it. It really is. It just shows you the power of science and how important it is to explore the hidden potential of these microbes. And it highlights the crucial role that medical microbiologists like you play in taking these discoveries and turning them into real solutions for patients. But while the potential of pre megaterium is really exciting, it's also important to remember that there are challenges things we need to consider. Yeah, we got to stay grounded. Like with any new technology or therapeutic approach, we need to be careful, evaluate the benefits and the potential risks. So what are some of the challenges researchers are facing? Well, one of the big ones is scaling up production. Prestia megaterium is a great protein producer in the lab, but getting that to industrial scale production, that's a whole other ball game. It's complex and expensive. <laughs> I can imagine. You can't just snap your fingers and have tons of these things making meds. Exactly. There's a lot to think about. Optimization, quality control, making sure the final product is stable and pure. We've got to overcome all of these hurdles before we can really use Prestia Megaterium to make therapies that are practical. What about safety? Are there concerns about using a bacterium, even one that's generally not harmful, in medical applications? I'm sure some people are a bit wary. It's a valid concern, and researchers are definitely thinking about it. Ensuring the stability of the genetically modified Prestia megaterium strains that are used in these applications, that's absolutely critical. We can't take any risks with human health or the environment. Making sure they don't accidentally become pathogenic, right? Or cause some other unintended consequences. You got it. And we can't forget about the regulations. Any new therapy or medical device, it's got to go through rigorous testing and get approval before it can be used on people. It's not just about the science. It's about navigating the regulatory landscape, making sure these innovations actually reach the patients who need them. That's right. It's about proving safety, effectiveness, having really tight quality control to meet those high standards set by the regulatory bodies. It's a long process, but it's necessary to make sure these discoveries actually lead to safe and effective treatments. I agree. And while there are obstacles, the potential benefits of Prestia megaterium in medicine, they're just too big to ignore. It's a good reminder that the microbial world has so much to offer, so much potential for tackling those really tough health challenges we face. And it shows how crucial medical microbiologists like you are in bridging that gap between those cool scientific discoveries and what actually happens in the clinic. Well, we've covered a lot in part two. We've looked at those exciting medical applications of Prestia megaterium from therapeutic protein production and targeted drug delivery systems to the development of biosensors. We even talked about the challenges, the things researchers are working hard to address to make all of this a reality. In part three, we're going to wrap up this deep dive. We'll look at the bigger implications of the research on Prestia megaterium and consider some thought-provoking questions about its future. We'll be right back to finish up our exploration, so don't go anywhere. And we're back for the final part of our deep dive into Prestia megaterium. Over the last two segments, we've really gotten to see just how powerful this bacterium is. It's been quite a journey, hasn't it? Really changing how we think about microbes. From producing essential medicines to potentially delivering drugs right where they're needed, and even playing a role in those cutting-edge biosensors, Prestia megaterium is proving to be a game-changer in the fight against disease. And the research is still going strong. I have no doubt we're going to see even more amazing applications in the years to come.
But now I think it's time to take a step back and look at the bigger picture. What are the implications of all this research on priest and megatherium? Yeah, what does it tell us about the future of medicine, about our relationship with the microbial world in general? These are questions that go way beyond this one bacterium. They get to the heart of science and innovation. For a long time, we've seen microbes as the enemy, as things that cause disease and need to be destroyed. But Priestie Megatherium is flipping that script. It's showing us that these microbes can be powerful allies, that we can use them for good, and that their potential benefits can far outweigh any risks we might perceive. It's a good reminder that most microbes are not harmful, and in fact, many are absolutely essential for life on Earth. Think about it. They're involved in nutrient cycling, decomposition, even keeping our own bodies healthy. And Priestie Megatherium is a perfect example of how we can harness that power to improve human health and well-being. Its rise in biotechnology also highlights the importance of collaboration across different fields. You've got microbiologists, geneticists, engineers, and medical doctors all working together to unlock the secrets of Priesta Megatherium. Working together to turn those discoveries into solutions that can actually help people. Exactly. And it underscores the importance of investing in basic research, even in organisms that might seem insignificant at first. You just never know where the next big breakthrough will come from. Who would have guessed that a bacterium you could find in the dirt could hold the key to producing life-saving medicines or creating those high-tech diagnostic tools? It really goes to show sometimes the most amazing discoveries come from the most unexpected places. It's that curiosity-driven research that keeps pushing the boundaries of what we know. So, looking forward, what might the future hold for Priesta Megatherium and its impact on medicine? What excites you the most? Personalized medicine. Imagine a future where treatments are tailored to each individual's genes and microbiome. That's an incredible concept. Priestia megatherium, because it can be genetically engineered and it works well with human cells, could be a key player in making that a reality. We could see therapies that are designed specifically for you and your disease, reducing side effects and making treatments more effective. That's the goal. And then there's synthetic biology. Scientists are now able to design and build brand new biological systems, creating organisms that can do things we've never seen before. That sounds like something out of science fiction. It does, right. But it's happening. And Priestia megatherium, with its well-understood genome and its ability to take on foreign DNA, it's perfect for synthetic biology. So we could potentially have these engineered Priestia megatherium strains that can do things we never thought possible. Exactly. Think about producing biofuels, cleaning up pollution, even detecting and destroying cancer cells. It's mind-blowing. The possibilities are endless. But as with any powerful technology, we have to be responsible. There are ethical considerations. Absolutely. As we dive deeper into genetic engineering and synthetic biology, we have to be aware of the potential risks. We need to make sure these technologies are used ethically. We need to have open conversations about the implications of these advancements and create clear guidelines for how they should be developed and used. That's a responsibility we all share, scientists, policymakers, and the public. As we wrap up our deep dive into Priestia Megatherium, I'm left feeling a sense of awe and wonder at the potential of the microbial world. We've seen how this seemingly simple bacterium is challenging our assumptions, pushing the boundaries of scientific innovation, and giving us hope for new and better ways to treat diseases and improve human health. And this is only the beginning. I can't wait to see what the future holds for Priestia Megatherium and all those other microbes out there just waiting to be discovered. Thanks for joining us on this incredible deep dive. We hope you've enjoyed exploring this fascinating world with us. Keep those minds curious, folks. And until next time, happy exploring.